So welcome, my name's Tara, and I own uh, Two Hives Honey. We are a local honey company here in Austin. So we care for about 350 hives or so, um, and all of our production hives, the hives that actually make our honey that we sell, are located within 20 miles of downtown Austin. So um, we are, you know, that's not always the case. You buy honey, it's not always produced in the city in which the bottle says, um, but we are, we are local and everything's produced within, you know, a, a 20 mile range of around downtown. And so a little bit of backstory of how we got here. This is actually one of our very first um, apiary partners. Um, there's, in fact, there's no apiary partners where we just have two hives anymore. Um, we kind of outgrew that pretty quickly, but we keep these hives here just because we've partnered with the Sustainable Food Center for years. We used to teach beekeeping classes, um, and I'll tell you all about some options that we have now, but um, they stopped teaching classes you know, at the center um, a year or two ago. But we've done lots of things over time, and we like being here. The garden's so beautiful. It's a nice little respite for us to come. And in fact, we aren't even allowed to sell the honey off the hives here because of the arrangement with the city but even still we love keeping them here because we love we love the SFC and we love the gardeners here um, so uh, a little bit about let's see where should we start um, so in the apiary I'm um, an apiary is just kind of a fancy word for a bee farm right um, there are there's, well, there's currently three hives in there um, so there's two what are called Langstroth hives that are in the front those are the ones that are cubes like, like boxes um, there's one now, we, we combine the two. Part of the management that we do is um, oftentimes going into winter, we might combine the hives. So any of you that have been around her for a while are probably familiar with seeing the hives moving from one to two a lot over the years. The two hives in the back are what are called top bar hives. Just a different type of hive. Um, and those are managed by Brandon Fahrenkamp, who owns Austin Bees. Um, Brandon is not a honey producer. He's what's called a bee removal guy. So he, if you had a hive in the eaves of your house, for example, like Brandon would be the type of person um, that you would call You would call if you needed help. So let's talk a little bit about um, kind of what the bees are doing every day and like maybe coexisting with them in the garden and, and what that looks like. So um, I talked about this a little bit before we got started here, but um, the only food source for adult honeybees is, the primary food source is nectar and honey. And honey is produced by dehydrating nectar, right? So that is all that they eat. Um, and bees are phenomenal little hoarders uh, because they don't have access to food very long over the course of the year. So here in Texas, really they only have access to nectar, you know, a short time in the spring and then again in the fall. And all the honey that they're able to make which is during what's called a nectar flow. So that's a period of time when there's a t like an exorbitant amount of nectar, then they can make honey. Um, and they only have that period for you know less than eight weeks here in Texas, so not a long time. But just because there's not a lot out there doesn't mean they won't go looking for it. So what you're seeing when you see the bees coming and going every day, um, those are the older ladies in the hive. And I use the female pronoun because all of the worker bees in a hive are female. So there's one queen whose job it is to lay eggs, a very small number of what are called drones, which are male drones whose job it is to spread the seed of the hive. Basically they go out to find other queens to mate with. They don't actually contribute to their own hive. Um, and then the entire rest of the hive are female worker bees. So all the bees that you see visiting the flowers are female worker bees and they're the foragers. So the foraging function is the last job that a worker bee will have. They'll rotate through jobs as they go through their very short six week lifespan. And so they're out foraging for four things. So they're foraging for propolis, which is a resin produced by botanical sources, like a lot of trees produce propolis. It's an antimicrobial substance. You might have seen it at health food stores. It's becoming very popular. They've, you'll see it in everything from mouthwashes and toothpaste to even shampoo. Um, so it's really, it's really good for you and it's highly antimicrobial. They use this propolis to kind of glue the hive together. So, and um, seal all the cracks and kind of protect the developing young. So you've got propolis, um, they're out looking for water most often in the summer months so here in texas you know that would be like as we move into june july august when they don't have a lot of nectar available they're getting their water they have to find water sources right um 
and uh, so that means you might see particularly in the morning if you I don't know if there's any irrigation lines is there any irrigation lines in any of the are they all hand water beds all hand water beds okay um, but that means if you've got a bucket of water out you know that you're you're watering or there's a lot of dew around the plants even if the plant doesn't have a flower and they're visiting it um, they might just be gathering the water so if you're seeing a lot of that um, that's what you're seeing there um, then of course they're gathering pollen so pollen's what's used to feed the young brood the babies in a hive and then finally nectar and as we talked about nectar is the primary food source for adult bees and then what they use to make honey so going back to this idea that honeybees are really good hoarders because they only have access to food a very short period of time they're going out each day frantically in search of food because what little food they can collect at any given point they have to often eat off of for the rest of the year if not years to come right so they're really good at hoarding um, so in the months, like in the spring months, like around May, and then again in September or October, if you're seeing a lot of activity at the hives, like Grand Central Station, just as fast as they can go in and out, it's probably because there's a lot of nectar available and they're employing their full resources to go out and collect that food before it's all gone, right? So that's what they're out collecting each day. So of course that means, you know, again, they might be out collecting water. Um, and then the rest of the time is spent visiting different flowers. So as you're out in the garden, um, you know, like if you can, the mist flowers, I saw some blue mist flower out there, like there's a lot of butterflies in that, but those kind of plants that have lots of blooms on them um, are usually going to be packed full of bees in the spring and in the fall months. Um, you're not gonna see them as much on the onesie twosies, like if you've got, a squash flower like maybe a couple of sunflowers the way that honeybees work is they're what's called forage consistent so they're going to draw all the nectar from one nectar source before they move on and they're going to deplete it and they're going to choose the larger nectar source options and so that means things like bushes of flowers or like rosemary bushes or sage bushes those kind of things and so when you're thinking about what can i plant to support honeybees in particular they like lots of blooms, right? They don't like the onesie twosies. Now, native bees work a little bit differently, and we can talk about them if you guys are interested, um, but you're most frequently gonna see them on the plants that have, again, lots of blooms on them. So if you're not as big a fan of the bees as I am, I wouldn't put like rosemary in your plot, <laughs> right? Because things like herbs that bloom several times throughout the year are definitely, um, a honeybee's favorite. If you're seeing them in the plots with your working, um, I know sometimes it's easier said than done for some folks, but there's really no need to be alarmed. I promise that she is far more interested in finding food for her family and her colony than she is with you. So they're not, um, they're not predatory, right? They're not out to get you. Um, when folks get stung in the garden, it's almost always accidental. Um, and there's some move that's made that makes the bees feel threatened. Right, so like um, maybe you're, you know, you're harvesting or you're clipping and you go to grab something and you come close to grabbing a bee and she recognizes that as that's aggressive, right? And so she just mistook your intentions. That's almost always what happens. I will say though, if you do get stung, um, what you wanna do is you wanna scrape the stinger out as fast as you can. On the end of the stinger, there's a little, so first of all, honeybees can only sting you once. Unlike wasps, right, which can go at you several times, they only get one bite of that apple. Um, the reason being is um, they, their stinger is attached to their internal organs. And so what happens is when she stings you and she flies off, the stinger stays in your skin and it rips out her intestines in the process. Now, the reason that that happens, because that really doesn't make any sense, right? That an organism dies to protect itself, like how they survive for 130 million years. The reason is because of pheromones released at that time. Um, a lot of people say it smells like bananas. I disagree. I think it has this very like a musky smell, but it's a pheromone that tells her sisters that danger is present. So this is why when we're working in the hives, if we get stung once in one area, it almost happened immediately we get a second sting in the same area, um, just because that pheromone, they react to it. So, um, so when she stings you, she flies away, her stinger will stay in your skin. She's going to die very soon after, she can't sting you again. And there's a little venom sac 
on the end of that stinger. And the longer that stinger is allowed to rest in your skin, the more venom that gets pumped in. So that's just gonna increase your reaction. You'll have more redness, more swelling, and the worst part, which I think is the itching. Okay, so the faster you can get the stinger out of your skin, the better. What I really want to leave with you today is do not grab the stinger, because if you do, you're just pushing all of the venom into the skin, right? So a funny little anecdote, we had a farm tour, our, our, uh, we have a honey ranch in Manor that you guys are all welcome to come visit. But we had a farm tour a couple weeks ago and a gal was out and she had her baby and they were in the shop and the baby was crawling on the ground and put his hand on a bee. And she, he's so little, he's not even a year old, and she picked him up and she looked at me and then her husband as if to say like, what do I do? And the husband goes in and I like tackle him out of the way because I didn't feel confident. Now, this is in the middle of COVID, right? So it was a bit of a risky move, um, but I like, sh I was like, no. And I elbowed him out of the way and like dove in and scraped it out with my fingernail because that took care of the venom. Um, and then I was like, I am so sorry and hope that was not inappropriate. But I was most concerned about the baby <laughs> and they were very thankful. In fact, she said, I looked at you first because I wanted you to do something and then I felt bad so I looked at my husband instead. <laughs> um, so scrape it out with your, your finger now. You know, you'll hear people say, go get tweezers. Okay, by the time you go and you locate the tweezers, like the damage is done. So just scrape it out with your finger now. Um, and that's a really great way to get the stinger out. So again, as I say, like there's real no reason to be afraid, but if you do get stung, know that you now are kind of marked, <laughs> right? And so it's not a bad idea if there's a lot of other bees around, maybe just step away and like wash the area with water, just so you don't have that pheromone kind of all over you. Another way that I find lots of people get stung accidentally is in their hair. So, um, if the bee's flying around and she happens to land in you and she gets caught in your hair, it might panic her. Um, and so when we're out working, not in full gear, you'll often see us in a ball cap just because it keeps the bees out of our hair. Um, but those are my best tips for kind of working alongside them, like being calm. And if you see them, you know, again, they're not out to get you. I encourage you to watch them and watch how they work. Um, all of the bees, you know, honeybees, bumbles, any of the solitary native bees, it's super fascinating to watch the way they work and to observe their body parts. They have very like sophisticated body parts um, for such a small insect, you know? So um, those are my best tips of sort of coexisting with the bees. Um, let's talk about some things that you can do like either here or at home in your garden to help support um, not just honeybees, but all pollinators. Um, so. You know, we talked about how water is really, really important. So if at your home you have a swimming pool, I get this complaint a lot of swimming pool, bees are getting in my swimming pool. Um, you know, providing a water source for pollinators can be really helpful. And um, we have a great blog on the website about that. The thing to remember is that bees drown really easily. And so if you have like a bird bath or something or a trough, if you have livestock and you're finding lots of dead bees, put something in there, um, floats, for them to land on, which can be lily pads or, you know, as simple as corks, anything that'll float stones, um, you know, large stones will work really nicely. So getting bees a water source, obviously planting anything that produces nectar or, or pollen is really important. And I encourage people to think about what blooms outside of the main bloom period. So lots of things bloom in May, right? April and May, there's lots of things blooming. There's lots of things blooming, you know, in late September into October, but it's every other time during the year. So in the summer, um, you know, as we move into the winter, the very early spring, those are times when our pollinators don't have a lot of food to eat. So thinking about those kinds of things that bloom in those times of year. So I always give the example of coral vine in the summer. It's not native, um, you know, it's what we would call like an adaptive species. And I think for a vine, it's pretty easy to control, but it blooms all through the summer and it produces a ton of nectar and it's really beautiful. So thinking about things that bloom outside of those main periods, the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center has an amazing online database that you can go on and filter by native Texas plants, bloom period, you know, what type of plant, um, and then they also have what are called special collections. And so you can just Google it, Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center Special Collections, and then you click on it and it narrows the database down to these collections. So they have one for 
butterflies, they have one for bumblebees, they have one for honeybees, they have one for native bees, um, all sorts of things. So that's a really great resource for you um, to think about. Um, let's see, what else? Um, let's talk a little bit about like kind of the dynamics of actual beekeeping a little bit for, I know that you're interested in um, maybe getting some hives started in your garden. Um, so beekeeping is legal in the city of Austin, obviously. <laughs> um, but there's a couple of things to keep in mind if this is something that you wanted to do at home. Um, in the city of Austin, you have to be 10 feet from your property line. Um, if you are within 25 feet of your property line, you have to have what's called a flyaway barrier, which is what you were mentioning. Um, and a flyaway barrier is anything that forces the bees to fly out of the hive up and over. I will tell you, they do that anyway. <laughs> That's what they do. So whoever wrote the law either didn't quite understand, but it also like, I just think it makes people feel better um, because as in of as much of it is as a flyaway barrier, it, it provides a barrier between you and the entrance of the hive. And so, you know, we've got the, the bees cordoned off here, but if we didn't, you would never want to walk the eight or 10 feet of space just in front of the entrance of the hives. Um, that is what's called their bee line. That's where that term comes from. And that's where the bees are coming and going every day. And if you're blocking that or kind of in that area, they might feel really defensive. So a flyaway barrier also just helps keep people out of that line. So you can see here, we've got some very fancy, the students at UT actually built this as a project some years ago. Um, it doesn't have to be this fancy though. Um, uh, anything, a fence, and it doesn't even have to be solid. Um, you know, a fence will work just, just well as well. Um, but like a trellis can be really nice. Um, you can plant beautiful things on it. Um, a fence, even a line of trees. Um, I tell folks that even if you aren't within 25 feet and you're not legally required to have a flyaway barrier, I like them for urban bees in the city because I find that for neighbors that might be a little anxious, okay, there's there's wild hives. If you had two hives in your backyard, there's probably a hundred wild hives within a mile, right? But if they're looking at your bees every day, they're like, there's like an alert. It, there's like an anxiety that can come along with it. And I just think if people don't see them so much, they don't worry about them as much. And I think that half of the war, the trouble of beekeeping in the city is just people unnecessarily worried. So um, do you have any questions about flyaway barriers that give you some ideas? It needs to be um, six feet tall. Um, city regulations require it be six feet tall um, and extend beyond either end of the of the hives. Now, we were we were looking at I was looking at fencing, uh, mm -hmm. just like picking up some panels from from Lowe's. Um, mm -hmm. But would you recommend it? So the spot where we're thinking of, I, I don't know. if this is going to happen, but the spot we were thinking of is near a fence line, um, but people typically walk that side of the fence line, like people that are gardeners, uh -huh. and so um, would you recommend going all the way around the hives, or? Probably would for your case, like if this is in your backyard, I mean the question was should I put a barrier all the way around? If it's in your backyard, that's uh, not necessary. But I think anywhere, any place where there's going to be public traffic, enclosing them is a good idea. Um, we have not had issues here. I mean, the, it's also locked, people can't get in. But we did have a couple instances where probably kids were like throwing rocks at the hives, which was just like not the smartest thing to do. Um, the nice thing about bees is that they kind of control their own destiny in that sense. So it didn't happen more than twice and then they stopped because I'm sure it didn't make for a very nice evening for them. But I think in your case, having a barrier around them is just a smart idea um, because you're not always gonna be there to educate people and just keeping them away from the hives um, is, is clever. And then what's great here is they've got the plexiglass on the front so people can actually watch them you know, from a, a bit of a distance. So you, would you say it's, it's more about keeping people away, like keeping the bees safe from people than keeping people safe from the bees? Yeah, like this, yeah, like you know, if, if like the bees wanted to leave the hive and like, oh, I hate to say this, cause, but go after someone like they can, right? You can't fence bees in, that's just not possible. So I think it's more of just keeping a good safe distance for everyone. 
Um, but again, if you want to do this in your backyard, there are some requirements per the city that you have to have being away from your property line and then doing this flyaway barrier if you're um, close. Oh, and then also in Austin, there's a density law. So there's no minimum amount of land to keep two hives as long as you can be 10 feet from your property line. If you wanted more than two, you had to have more than a quarter acre and it kind of goes up every quarter acre. You can have more hives is kind of the way that it, that it works. Um, in terms of someone had asked about the types of hives, um, you know, there's, there's lots of different kinds. The two kinds that we have here, the um, Langstroth and the Top Bars are the most popular. The beekeeping is the same. I mean, it really is. You'll find people that feel very strongly about one or the other, but honestly, either of them work. We started on langs. They each have their pros and their cons. I started on top bars. We do langs because you, all things being equal, we'll get more honey from langs and that's how we make our money, of course. Um, if for any of y'all that are interested, um, you know, we, we, we're big education providers. So we teach tons of beekeeping classes. We have a six Saturday apprenticeship program. It's a six Saturday program that we do twice a year and it sells out. Like it's a very successful, fun program. Um, but with COVID outside of the apprenticeship, we canceled all of our in-person classes and we've been doing Zoom classes, but we actually just um, came out with a really beautiful four course or four part online beekeeping course. Um, really well filmed with beautiful fun animation i mean there's like literally animated bees having sex which is super fun and um, and then it comes with a downloadable book so if that's of interest to you guys i can take your email and i'll send you a little code um to save you some money if you're interested in that we're actually soon going to have a partnership with the sfc um, that anyone buys through their link a portion of the proceeds will go back to the sfc so that's coming soon so if y'all are interested you know um i've got cards for you um, that are about us and then you can give me your email and I'm happy to share with you um, but it's it's the for someone brand new to bees like kind of how to get started it takes you from I think I want to be a beekeeper to the starting line of okay now I've got the apiary and I've got the bees um, so anyway, I'll share that with you guys um, um, uh, question yeah. so yeah. harvesting honey yeah. Yeah. Uh, the bees have stored it uh, it's in theory the resource it's going to provide for them for a while how do you take only the minimum amount you need to yeah, it's a good yeah question. It's a good. so the question is when you're harvesting how what's the decision making process to make sure if that's what they eat how do you take it right so um this is where beekeeping comes a little bit more of an art and not so much science but basically um we make an a very educated presumption about how much honey this particular hive needs in this area until the next time they have access to food. And so that means, and then we take whatever's extra. So that means for some hives in some areas, it might be 30 pounds for the winter and some hives we might have to leave 45. And the factors that go into that decision-making is how strong is the hive and um, how well, how much nectar is generally available in that area? When is it generally available? Um, where we are in the year? And so anything beyond that, you know, we, we harvest. And so we're more conservative in some areas and more aggressive in others. But that does mean that there's plenty of hives in any given year that we just don't harvest from, right? Like we didn't harvest a single pound last fall because we didn't feel like we could, because as I mentioned, it was really tough fall last year. So we didn't take any. Um, we just finished our fall harvest for this year. The fun thing about honey when it's harvested in really small batches like we do and treated with the respect that I personally think it deserves is um, different flowers make different types of honey and uh, because bees are forage consistent right you have all these different little pockets of different types of honey in a hive so when we harvest really small batches like we do you get this feel for this rainbow of colors and flavors even just here in central Texas right so the fall harvest that we just pulled is really dark and rich and robust, whereas the spring harvest, um, you know, tends to be a little bit more floral. Um, when we pull honey off of bee balm, um, which is a really great bee-friendly wildflower, um, the honey tastes minty, almost like menthol and vanilla. Um, the honey that's made off the mesquite trees is electric yellow and has this almost like almondy flavor. Um, so that's the really cool thing about, you know, harvesting honey in small batches, but that's how we do it. So it's just, we um, 
are very careful to try to make the most responsible decisions. Sometimes we guess wrong or the weather doesn't cooperate in a way that we do, but we really work hard to put bees first. Bees first. If you guess wrong and take too much, can you get raw honey from another hive and transport it over? Yes, yeah, so we, yeah, so we can share resources. So, um, you know, the reason that we always like to keep two here at a minimum is that we can share resources between hives all the time. So that means we can share not only honey, nectar, pollen, even br uh, babies, like uh, developing bees to some extent. So if you've got a hive that's a little bit weaker, we can boost it from the hive next door. Um, and then the, going back to the honey for just a moment, you know, the reason that we have this like very generic idea of what honey should taste like and look like and the color, et cetera, is because anything that you buy from a producer that doesn't do it the way that we do it, it's blended honey. So just all their honey gets dumped in together. So you lose that really interesting nuance of the nectar sources. But yeah, so we can share. Um, and if we get really stuck, as I mentioned, we can feed bees sugar water. It'll keep them from dying. It's not my favorite thing to do. Sometimes we have to, um, but they're not going to. It's not an option to take. Well, some people do, but it's not an option for us to take all of their honey and feed them sugar water because they're just going to be sick bees, right? It'd be like, you know, you eating, I don't know, McDonald's burgers every day. Like you'd be really, you wouldn't have very good nutrition, right? And you'd have a lot of health problems as a result. Yeah. yeah. So can you speak to, um the concern about killer bees yes. Um, yes. in Texas weather. Uh, you don't hear much about it. Like back in the 70s when I was growing up, we were concerned about the invasion yes. of killer yes. bees coming yes. up. Yes. And yes. it really yes. hasn't been all that much trouble, but how how do you protect us from this becoming a killer bee problem? Yeah, so, yeah. Oh, so such a good question. Thank you for asking. Hi there. So, um, Okay, there are seven different subspecies of honeybees. Um, by the way, honeybees are not native to North America. They're native to Europe, Asia, Africa. Um, and there's seven different subspecies of, 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 of honeybees. And they have, just like different species of um, different plants, right? They all have their own traits and things. And so the species, the subspecies that's native to Africa um, tend to swarm very quickly, which is a hive's way of reproducing. So they make more hives very quickly. So they spread quickly and they also tend to be very, very aggressive. So unlike the Western honeybees, that's mostly what you find in the US, um, these colonies are much, much more aggressive and more prone to attack from further distances from their home in larger numbers. And so, the, the history behind that, it's really interesting. Um, you know, there's laws in place that you can't take um, bees in and out of the United States without special permits. Um, and, but not everybody has these laws <laughs> or follows them in a way that they should. And in Brazil, they took some of this subspecies to Brazil and were doing a bunch of testing. Some scientists were doing a lot of like um, research on them. Um, of whether or not they would produce more honey than some of the other subspecies. And a number of the queens were either released or escaped from the lab. I'm not really sure. This sounds like a weird sci-fi movie, I know. Um, but like a number of queens were released from the lab. And because they breed very quickly, we started to see um, this subspecies spread into the genetics of you know, more of the Western um, European honeybees that we have here. And so we don't have any clean species, right? These honeybees mate in the air. Um, and so they're all interbred, they're all mutts. But if you have a stronger incidence of these particular genes, you might have a more aggressive colony, right? And so we watch, you know, you're, you're right. We, the U.S. watched, the, was tracking the movement of this species up through um, South America into the southern part of the United States. So you have them in Arizona, much more prevalent in South Texas um, because they can't handle any cold climates at all. So the way that we protect you from that here is that one, this is a totally manageable concern by the beekeeper if the beekeeper knows what they're doing. So um, first of all, we source our bees. We know the genetics of our bees because we purchased them from a breeder that's responsible and we know their techniques and methods. And then so the only way that we would get those genetics in our hives is if our queen died, they had to rear a new queen and she went out and she mated. And any of the drones that she mated with had these undesirable characteristics. They look exactly the same. You can't tell by looking at them. In fact, you could only tell their genetics if you sent them to a lab and have them tested. 
But all that aside, that doesn't really matter. We're just concerned about making sure people are safe, right? And so let's say one of our hives went queenless and we let them open mate. Um, we would just watch it carefully. And if we started to see an uptick in aggression as we were working the hives, then we would manage that. And you do that by killing that queen, buying a new one from a breeder that you trust and putting her in. And then all of her offspring will have the traits that are more favorable. Does that make sense? Yes. Any other questions about bees? And if you have any more specific questions about this, I can like, we can chat after as well. I'm happy to help you guys think through some of the concerns or problems, but anyone else have any other questions I can answer today? Ways to encourage and support other species. Oh yes, thank you for asking that. So we love native bees. We make our money off of um, honey bees, but we talk about native bees wherever we get the chance. Um, so as I mentioned, Honeybees aren't native to North America, um, and there's, you know, there's there's become this like surge or kind of this like backlash of like people upset that we do spend we do spend way too much talking time talking about honeybees. I'm the first to admit that, and that we shouldn't none of us should have honeybees, and we should just support the native bees. But I'm a realist, and I know that we all love honey, <laughs> and so my approach is that. Let's take something that everyone's already curious and interested in, and then we'll use that platform to like have other discussions, right? And so um, there are something like 4,000 species of native bees native to Texas. Um, and there's far too many to name, but you've got bumblebees. Um, uh, bumblebees are the only native bee that lives in a colony. So honeybee colonies can be 30 to 50,000 bees. Bumblebees are like 200 bees. They're really small and they're really fascinating um, because unlike a honeybee colony where you have thousands of bees that overwinter, in a bumblebee colony, the only bee that overwinters one bee, the queen. And then the next year, um, when it's springtime, she acts as a queen slash worker bee. So she does all the work, builds the nest, brings back all the food until she has produced offspring to take that function off of her back and then she just becomes a queen laying eggs again. So bumblebees are really cool. Um, there's longhorn bees, sweat bees, mason bees, leafcutter bees, uh, fairy bees, I mean carpenter bees. There's, there's so many to name. Um, if you ever come visit us we've got a big poster um, at the ranch that you can you can you can check out. Um, but ways to support them all the things I just mentioned about water and planting nectar and pollen producing um, plants is really important. But for a lot, so 80% of these native bees nest in the ground. Um, and so the best thing you can do for the native bees is providing habitats for them. And so for the ground nesters, things that you can do is not keeping a super, you know, no to lawns, right? Um, and if you've got an area that's more wooded, like not clearing all the leaves in the fall or leaving some brush or piles of wood because those are areas where those native bees will nest. So that's really good for the ground nesters. Um, for carpenters, leaf cutters, and mason bees, these are bees, so masons and leaf cutters live in reeds. Like think of like empty flower reeds um, and, um, or flower stems. And then carpenters like to bore in wood. So if you have a bunch of holes in your deck, You've probably been hit by the carpenter bees. If you don't like that, paint your deck. They don't like painted wood, so that can help. But you can build or buy a little habitat for these guys. So that can be as simple as taking a block of wood and drilling holes in it. You want six to eight inch holes and they'll nest in that. There's one over here against the tree. Um, uh, yes, back there, there's one over there. So you can go check that out for ideas. Um, bamboo cane is really great nesting spots for for the native bees so you can chop down your bamboo into six to eight inches and put that in a vessel giant cane um, we have a ton of giant cane at the ranch you're welcome to come out and take as much as you want and take it back and make a native bee home but habitat's really important so doing some research on um, providing habitat for those bees i think is the best thing you can do any questions um, I've got some cards if you guys would like. I'll leave them up here and you can, it's just like a fun little bee graphic on the front and then it's all about us on the back. Um, oh, these are our old address. So, 
Oh, no, it's not. Just, just a few is the old address. I'll put only the new address ones out. So these have our address on there. We're open three days a week. Um, you can come check us out. Follow us on Instagram. We do lots of fun things. And like I say, if you're interested in the class and the discount, um, give me your email and I will send it to you. But if we can help, if you ever have questions, don't hesitate to reach out. We're happy to come and do this Thanks. once a year. It's totally fine. Um, we enjoy working with the gardeners. Okay. Let's give her a big okay. Oh, thanks, guys.